start off. Perfect. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for coming to our event. Thank you for joining us for A Healthy Living Soil, A True Story. I'm Teddy Tomeo from NOFA New York, and I'm the Long Island Transitions Educator. We also have Elena from NOFA Certification on for technical support. If you have any uh, te specific technical questions, feel free to contact Elena directly via chat. Just a reminder, remain muted, and please feel free to keep your video on throughout the presentation or off, whichever you prefer. We also have enabled closed captioning. These captions are auto-generated and not perfect, but if you would like to see the captions, there should be a notification at the top of your screen enabling you to do so. Uh, this workshop is being recorded and will be shared on the conference website and mobile app shortly after the end of the presentation. And please feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. You can either use the raised hand option or you can type your questions and I'll read them out throughout the chat. Uh, NOFA New York's annual winter conference would not be possible without the support of our generous sponsors. NOFA New York would like to sp specifically thank our app sponsors, Hudson Valley Farm Hub and Honey Dog Farm. To learn more about these organizations and their work, please visit them in the marketplace or online. And now I'd like to pass it off to Monique Bosch of uh, NOFA, Connecticut. Hi, thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us. And uh, I, I'm admitting people as we go. So <laughs> I, I'm not sure if Teddy or Elena- Oh, we can admit everyone, don't okay, worry. So I'll, I'll, yep. I, I'll try not to do that job too. Uh, <laughs> so I have a presentation about microbes and how to get them and how to improve your soil. And my main question for all of you, and it, you can put this in the chat, is what are you most interested in? So for example, if I start going on about compost tea and everyone's like, we really are not going to do that. Or if you think you have a real interest in that, I can go deeper into these different subjects. So I'm leaving it up to you to sort of steer me. Um, I've asked Teddy and Elena to interrupt if you have any questions so that we can catch them as we go. Um, and especially because I tend to go fast, if you want me to focus on any specific topic. So I'm going to start sharing my screen here. And this is this PowerPoint presentation. All right, so everyone should be seeing Healthy Living Soil, A True Story. Uh, start from the first slide. So basically what I'm going to talk about is, or we're gonna look at, is taking a close-up look at soil, compost, and compost tea under the microscope. And uh, we're going to check out the life that's in there. And then we're going to um, look at what the, the effects of these microbes have on soil. So I have some videos of that, or short videos, and then also what we can do to increase the microbial life. And I'm gonna start with this, the symbiotic relationship that exists between plants and microbes, which we're just learning more and more about. The fact that the plant, and I always do this, takes in um, sunlight, converts that sunlight to energy, exudates, and puts up to 50% of that those exudates through the roots to feed the microbes. And in exchange, microbes get whatever nutrients that plant has the potential to take up and feeds that back to the plant. That's a symbiotic relationship. That's how important it is to have healthy living soil. So we'll, I'll go on about that, obviously. Um, Miram, just so you know, Mira, uh, I mean, Monique, just so you yeah. know, Miram commented in the chat saying, that they are most interested in improving raised bed soils and orchard soils. But I'm um, happy to hear anything you have to say about soil biology. Cool, all right. So the ways you deal with your soil um, will affect how many nutrients, as I've just talked about, that symbiotic relationship, um, how many nutrients that plant can take up. So, We'll, we'll discuss that and I'll, I'll try to focus on raised beds versus an orchard situation. Okay, so um, I'm gonna move my, the, the pictures or the, what do you call that? <laughs> Everybody's name so that I can see better the screen. Okay, so soil health is basically the continued capacity of soil to function as a, what I like to call a vital living ecosystem. And that will sustain the plants, the animals, and of course us. 
So uh, this is a, a beautiful dancing uh, nematode. And as you can see, I call things beautiful and, and wonderful. <laughs> so not necessarily scientific, but the microbiologists that are scientific say uh, that they are estimating there is as many as 1.5 million species of soil fungi and 3 million species of bacteria. What we're finding though with agricultural soils that really were, they're not finding more than 5,000 species present. So Gabe Brown, who works in the, in the, um, the West, uh, the Midwest, and is working on teaching ranchers and farmers about the importance of soil life, says that the soil beneath us is alive and there are more organisms in a teaspoon of healthy soil than there are people on earth. And I'm, you might've heard this quote from various people before. And this is what that soil food web looks like. Um, and it's basically different trophic levels, similar to above ground where you have the animal kingdom, below ground, you have that same sort of hierarchy where the smallest, which we'll look at the bacterial fungi, uh, moving up to the predators of that bacteria fungi, the, the protozoa, the nematodes, microarthropods, and then moving up from that to earthworms, animals, birds, and all of those contributing to this soil food web. Um, so here's a quick look at what little bacteria looks like, um, as well as fungi. She said, moving forward, here we go. Another piece of fungal hyphae. And usually in my talks, I will go through every different type of, of um, life that you will find in soil, what I've done instead is put together a video that quickly explains it so that um, that I make sure that I get, I hit all the buttons here. So uh, let me go to the next slide. Uh, all right, I have to get this button here. Um, the, the one I wanted to mention here, uh, when we are talking about life in soil, bacteria and fungi, also have a relationship. And so we want to find a nice balance of bacteria fungi for food we wanna grow. If you disturb the soil, if, you're, um, if your soil is bare, generally it's 100% bacterial. So you're selecting for weeds in that case. If you go into an old growth forest, it's 100% fungal and you're selecting for mature trees. What we wanna do is um, have that balance so we do want to have fungal in our, comp in our compost, in our soils, so that we can grow these plants here. Um, and so if we move forward from there, um, brassicas, for example, annual crops, they can handle more bacterial dominant soil. As you're moving towards the woodland edge, perennials, things like strawberries, they want a more fungal dominated soil. So I'm going to play this video and it's going to talk about all those different microbes I just mentioned. Health, healthy living soil is filled with a balance of fungi, bacteria, protozoa, nematodes, and microarthropods. An incredible diversity of organisms make up the soil food web. From the tiniest one cell bacteria, algae, fungi, and protozoa, to the more complex nematodes and microarthropods, to the visible earthworms, insects, and plants. We're going to zoom in 100 to 400 times magnification to check out these critters living in our soil and get a close-up look at what healthy soil looks like. First, let's take a look at bacteria. The smallest, most plentiful microbes, bacteria benefit plants by increasing nutrient availability, including nitrogen. Chemical fertilizers and pesticides limit bacterial numbers, stopping aggregates from being formed, leaving no structure in the soil. Tilling leads to bacterial dominant soil, thereby selecting for weeds. Soil that's left undisturbed has a nice balance of bacteria fungi with plentiful aggregates, organic matter, and soil structure. Fungi grow in long thread-like strands or hyphae in the soil. Reduced tillage allows fungi to flourish so they can help plants take up water and nutrients, resist disease, and tolerate drought. A fungal dominant soil is usually found in woodlands and around mature trees. Incorporating fungal dominant soil in your compost or compost tea can help inoculate soils 
leading to a balanced fungi bacterial ratio, selecting for crops we want to grow. Protozoa are single cell predators, which include flagellates, amoeba, and ciliates. They feed on bacteria, fungi, other protozoa, and organic matter, releasing plant available nutrients. Protozoa are responsible for mineralizing nitrogen in agricultural soils. They are also a good source of food for other soil organisms and help prevent certain pathogens from establishing on plants. Like protozoa, nematodes are important in releasing nutrients in plant available form. They help distribute bacteria and fungi through the soil by carrying microbes on their surfaces and in their digestive systems. They are useful indicators of soil quality since nematode populations are impacted by all land management practices. They enhance soil quality by regulating the populations of other soil organisms and consuming disease-causing organisms. Microarthropods. They are fundamental to the creation of humus and the formation of soil. They contribute to a healthy soil ecology, especially helping with the decomposition of soil organic matter into a form that bacteria can consume. They contribute to nutrient cycling in the soil and also help suppress plant pests. They actually increase nitrogen in soil by digesting microbes and organic matter. I do love those guys. <laughs> so um, that is a, a quick soil. view. Hold on, see if I can go to the next slide. Here we go. So I do go around and teach microscopy. And uh, in fact, I, I was teaching staff at Nofa New York. They all actually came to Connecticut. And uh, we had a couple of online sessions and then a live session where um, they became proficient at doing uh, their own microscopy. And then they went to different parts of New York State and are, um, can be teaching it to hopefully farmers and, and uh, organizations. So, so that's something I'm really passionate about. Healthy. Oh, um. Monique, there's one comment from the video. Um, Bill asks, what would you suggest if ample nutrients are available, but mineral uptake, calcium, potassium, et cetera, is insufficient? Right. Um, so I do think a soil test is still important. And um, there's nothing wrong with adding organic amendments uh, when necessary. But I really do prefer to find a compost that has those organic um, um, elements in it. And one thing I'll do, we uh, disclosure here, my son and I have a worm composting business. And one of the things we feed the worms are trace minerals. In this case, where I am in Connecticut, we use basalt rock dust. So indigenous minerals, adding that to compost, and in our case, uh, worm composting, uh, we are finding their plant available in the finished worm castings. And the same would be true for compost. So. Uh, incorporating that in a compost and then applying that, I think is the best way to get those minerals into your soils. I hope that answered that question. If not, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> okay, any other questions um, relating to what we just talked about? It looks like we're all caught up in the chat for now. Okay, cool. Just trying to think the best way to forward here. Okay, so here we're talking about, this is an NRDC poster that, that I refer to quite a bit. Uh, we're talking about dead versus living soil. And the one thing you'll notice, if it's bare, it's unprotected, chances are it's dead. Um, it's going to turn hard and it won't be porous. Uh, and you'll of course get erosion because there's nothing to hold that, that soil in place. You'll need increased chemicals. And then of course, those are going to leach into the groundwater because there's nothing to hold them. And um, the plants will be susceptible to, to um, pests and, and diseases. And of course, bare soil is, as I talked about, um, bacterial dominant. So you not only disturb the weed seeds um, when you till or, or have bare, bare soil, but they're, they're perfect conditions for those seeds to germinate. That's mother's nature's way of, you know, soil wants to be covered. And uh, so that's, that's telling there. Uh, when you have living soil, generally you can tell. When you're looking at your soil, if you have earthworms, for example, um, that's an excellent idea because they're at the higher trophic level in your uh, soil food web. So they have to be able to eat organic matter and, and, um, and bacteria and nutrients. Um, so 
the, the other way to ha make sure you have um, living soil is to keep the residue. So from previous crop crops, don't pull everything out. You can cut it and leave um, the residue above ground and below ground as that, that residue from, from previous crops decomposes, it will be food for the microbes and will, will decompose and also add to organic matter. So also living soil will have microorganisms in it, uh, the, the, which we talked about. The one thing that I found funny that they added here was cover crops. Um, so actually, um, the reason that that's interesting is it's not indicative of um, living soil, but it is helpful in making your soil more alive. And we'll talk about that a little later. So any questions about that? Uh, everything looks clear at the moment. Okay, cool. Um, so you want to, uh, there, these are ways uh, we can build up soil, soil life and sequester carbon. And basically the most important is avoid any chemical, physical and biological stressors like, for example, chemical, no artificial right. pesticides and fertilizers. Um, it'll destroy the, the soil life and it just degrades the soil and it does stop that, that carbon building process. The other thing, manual tilling. So as Zach Bush, if you want to look him up, he has some great talks online. He talks about rototilling being equally damaging to the soil as spraying chemicals. He also says one application of chemical fertilizer will kill half the life in your soil. So. Uh, one other ways to build up soil and sequester carbon is diversity. So moving away from the monocultures in um, commercial farming that we see. We wanna have as much diversity as possible. And we wanna keep living roots in the soil uh, as much of the year as we can. And we can do that by having perennial plants there, growing more perennial plants, um, ways to, to, to change what you're growing so that you don't need to reapply um, plant, um, seedlings every spring. Um, you, can, you can have the perennial plants um, feed us more and more. Having ground covers so that there is no exposed soil um, and cover crops, which we'll talk about again. Intercropping is another way uh, so that when you do harvest a crop, you um, have other crops that are going to fill in that area. So we'll talk about that. So basically keeping the soil covered as much as possible. If you can see the soil, you know that it's losing carbon, vitality and life. And um, the most effective way is to use cover crops. And I had to laugh when I saw this, this image, I'm thinking, talk about a monoculture. We just got buckwheat there. And um, in one of the talks, uh, one of the, the, the participants mentioned, Yes, but that's only going to be there for eight to 10 weeks and then something else will be there. So it will be diverse over time. So I, I'll give them that. So we might have a monoculture of one cover crop, although I prefer using cover crop cocktails, if you will. But knowing that it's going to be there, do its job, whatever that is, at, depending on when you, when you plant it, um, and moving from there to, to other crops means that you can have diverse plants. Um, some key in, uh, reasons for, um, for building soil, or the, <laughs> how do I say this? I could just read the slide. Soil biology is key to building soil and, car and carbon and land health. So um, it makes the, the nutrients plant available, as I talked about. Um, it captures atmospheric nitrogen and fixes that in the soil. Um, it gives the plants a stronger immunity. And I have a test trial to, to kind of demonstrate that. It holds those nutrients in the soil. And one of the main reasons, and you'll see some, some images of soil, one of the reasons that, that, that uh, the nutrients stay in the soil and it's moisture retention is that the, the bacteria is actually sticky. And the plants that are, are putting exudates into the soil are also putting glues into the soil. So then you get these aggregates being formed in the soil and that will hold the nutrients and hold the moisture and create the soil structure that we want to have. Um, as I mentioned, the, 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 the carbon rich glues that the plants exude. And also with all of that life in the soil, 
um, the composting process is definitely sped up. We're going to talk a lot about composting. I hope that's okay. Um, Monique, Lou asked, yeah. how can you plant in uncultivated ground? One thing that we've been experimenting with, I'm working up at the Berkshires at um, the college there, Simon's Rock. We are, we put the rototiller away. We are um, taking the, the, um, the undisturbed soil, if you will, undisturbed ground with a number of plants on it, cutting it very low, laying down cardboard and putting half decomposed compost on top. So things from, um, that have manure in them or, or that, that are not finished composting. Um, we'll add that in the winter, in the fall, sorry. It will slowly decompose over the, the winter. And in the spring, we're gonna plant right into that compost. Meanwhile, that cardboard will be a barrier from any weeds, weeds or plants coming up. And it will also be consumed by the microbes. And when we will probably start with, with um, in a lot of the beds with cover crop, that will also help to establish the bed and, and, and break down that, that, um, that barrier that was there that is now covered with the cardboard and the compost. And did I mention um, a mulch on top, usually leaves or straw. So that's how we are doing it. And um, so far, very good results where we're not rototilling, which you can do. You can rototill once. Uh, first of all, do a soil test, find out what amendments, find out what your acidity is like, add those. And then from then on, don't disturb the beds that you've created. Okay. And then um, Elizabeth asks, could you comment on hydroponic food production? Can plants have the nutrient density as plants grow in healthy soils? Do you know of research that corro uh, corroborates this difference? That's an excellent question. Um, I have stayed away from hydroponics just because I believe so much in what the soil can give us that I, I don't want to bypass that. You get dependent on chemicals if you are if you have a water-based solution to grow plants, and you just heard uh, some opinions about adding uh, chemical fertilizers. So, as much as we can work with nature, I think is better. So I won't comment on studies, but I will say um, I will not work with with um, anything um, hydroponically. Um, and so I, I really have no knowledge on that. But I have found with soils, I have learned about what works with soil and how to work with nature when you want to build soil and build the microbes in soil. So when you do create this um, soil food web, um, you're, you're com combating pests, pests naturally. So you've got, um, you're supporting the habitat that, that um, will feed off the pests that you have. You're going to be rotating crops so that if you do have a problem with a pest in one area, um, say you had tomato blight in an area, I would suggest not planting tomatoes in that particular site the next year and rotating another crop. So we'll talk about crop rotation. And also one of the main things is having, making sure that you have good airflow in your garden so that it's not packed up and the plants are so close that you, you have room for, for these, these um, pests to, to take hold. The, this for me is the most important part of um, building for soil food web. And that is adding the compost and mulches. My, mainly I'm gonna talk about compost and organic, the organic matter um, that, is, that comes with that. Uh, so I hope everybody's good with me going on about compost. We're, we're half an hour in, so um, it, it, you could say a comment like, no, thank you, uh, but I am gonna talk about compost. And this is just to show you some, some images that have helped me understand compost, all types of composting and what is going on. So it starts with, of course, Elliot Coleman, who's growing food year round in Maine. Wonder how he did this last few days with this brutal cold. He talks about producing quality compost is the most important job on an organic farm. And I would agree with him. Uh, there's different types of composting, of course. Uh, and the most important thing for me, uh, when I'm thinking of doing any type of composting is keeping this carbon to nitrogen ratio um, 
in my mind at all times, whatever I'm adding when I'm making compost. So you're looking at, in this case, high carbon, and then I have another slide, high nitrogen. And so the sweet spot, and I'll go back to these slides, uh, but the sweet spot is really 25 to 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. So if you have a, a lot of wood chips, a lot of straw, you're, you're gonna be high carbon. And so it just definitely will slow down decomposition. So if you add all of your food waste and then more food waste and maybe some manure, you're going to find it's going to be excessive in nitrogen and you're gonna end up with a stinky pile. So that's why that balance is so important. So going back to these high carbon, just to give you an idea, wood chips, 400 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. So you never really wanna put wood chips on your garden bed because what they'll do is draw out all of the nitrogen, which is not what you want. On your pathways, that's fine. But when you're making a compost, I like to mix it with, uh, you can add some wood chips, especially if you do have a lot of wood uh, food scraps, but I like a more balanced. So um, things like straw, things like um, corn waste, uh, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, wood ash, interestingly, you would think would be high carbon, but it's only a 25 to one. Um, I do like adding wood ash, but keep in mind, if you're looking for acidic soil or you have alkaline soil, adding wood ash will make it more alkaline. So that's just something with wood ash. Um, when you're looking at high nitrogen, uh, you'll see, for example, coffee grounds, which you think is brown, is actually very high in nitrogen and can be quite acidic. So you wanna, if you're, um, especially in a worm composting bin, you might wanna limit how much coffee you would put in there. Uh, garden waste is moving up a little bit, but it is quite high in nitrogen. So these were quite interesting and eye-opening to me to see how much nitrogen is in these samples. So moving on, we're gonna talk about three types of composting, the hot thermophilic, the cold or static, and worm composting. Uh, so when we're talking about thermophilic, it's um, you really want a diverse number of materials. Um, it can be labor intensive for sure. And, um, it, it can be quick though. I mean, you can get it done in 30 days in some cases. And it, the nicest thing about it is you can put a lot of different amendments in there um, because it will kill the weed seeds and the pathogens because the temperature gets so hot in there. Um, but finding those exact ratios, and I have a perfect example of <laughs> when that didn't work out, um, it can be hard. So I worked with uh, Dr. Lane Ingham and at one point, I visited her at her farm in California and we really worked on a very simple way to do thermophilic where you take 20 buckets, two of those buckets are high nitrogen. In this case, she used manure from um, pastured animals. Uh, six of those buckets are green material. And again, you can scale up or down, but this is the ratio. Um, so anything from weeds without seeds, um, she doesn't put those in there, hedge trimmings, vines, leaves, um, and 12 of those, I was surprised, you have up to 12 um, that are woody. So that's the wood chips and the straw, although she put very little wood chips, um, anything like bedding, things like that. And then you, you mix it all up. Uh, one of the main things to do is water. So did I mention carbon nitrogen? The other two things that you need to do for any type of composting is air, which is, you would think is a, <laughs> of course, right? And the other one is uh, moisture, water. So um, what, what she was doing is having these, these especially the high carbon um, sources, um, they would sit in water, soak in water. And then you basically start mixing these ingredients. So um, here she's got the hose watering everything down. Um, so this is what we end up with. So we add a couple of buckets of this, a couple of buckets of that, and then hold it together with this mesh. And this is our pile. And then you can see uh, the rules for a thermophilic compost. You have to maintain a temperature of 131 days, sorry, 131 degrees for 15 days and you have to turn that pile five times in order to be considered certified thermophilic composting. Um, keep in mind, the temperature needs to be up to 145 degrees to be able to kill weeds. So um, that's one of the reasons 
not necessarily put a good idea to put weed seeds in your in your compost. So then you turn the pile after it reaches a certain temperature, say 150 degrees, you'll take the pile apart, put whatever on the was on the outside on the inside and, and mix it up like that. Um, and then you would do that five times. Uh, hopefully in 15 days, you, you've reached that 145 degree temperature each time to, and then you're able to turn it. It's very labor intensive, believe me. Um, and uh, then you will take your pile, spread it out, and you will let it sit for six months um, till it cools. Now keep in mind, the only thing that's living in there now after that, um, these different levels, the, after the thermophilic level um, is the bacteria, which is what caused the high temperatures. So then during that maturation phase, it, you hope that other microbes will, will um, come into the pile. You can even inoculate it if you want with compost tea, a suggestion there. Um, because they, it does take some time to have the other microbes come in and make use of the, the wonderful organic matter that is in your compost. So here I am, I'm at uh, uh, Reservoir Community Farm, our, our farm in uh, Bridgeport, uh, run by GVI and, and young people. And we are making the uh, thermophilic compost. And what we managed to get was some spent hops from a local brewery. Um, keep in mind though, that that was um, very high nitrogen, 12 to one. I didn't realize it was so, so high in nitrogen. So we mixed it up, came back, this what I was Friday, Saturday, we're back and it's really smelling bad. And, and the thermometer says 170 degrees. And I'm thinking, oh my, what is going on? So we're taking the pile apart. It's not, not pretty, ladies and gentlemen, and putting it back together. And uh, that was a lot of work, especially with that smell. So now it's Sunday and I'm thinking, wow, that heated up quickly. So I went the, that morning back to the farm and I could see the steam really coming up over the pile. So I put the thermometer in, it was 178 degrees. I mean, these things can catch fire. So I'm like, oh, what have I done? So I take it apart, I'm spreading it. And of course, so this is what it was looking like the neighbors were really not happy with me. They were all, it was a beautiful day. They were slamming their windows. The, the interns never invited me back to do thermophilic composting again. Um, and I learned my lesson to really know what, what uh, carbon nitrogen ratio I have of what I'm putting in there. Because basically when you see um, the compost heap steaming like this, you're off gassing nitrates, which as, as Steve Solomon says in this wonderful book, The Intelligent Gardener, that's the last thing you wanna have happen. The, the good side of that story is I was there this past summer and um, I, I ran into Robert Peck, who uh, I'm doing this, this video about composting. And uh, he gave me a demonstration on how to do thermophilic composting properly. And so he has visitors, a lot of field trips and students come and they, they make thermophilic compost in the right way. So that's, that's a good story, a happy story. Um, I'm gonna show you this little video here talking about the three methods of thermophilic composting. And then I want you to take a look at the different, we look at each one under the microscope and maybe we can talk a little bit about the difference that we found. So let me play this, it's, I think it's four minutes. We have a large diversity of ingredients that we start our compost with from uh, bedding and manure and leaves, wood chips, coffee grounds, um, a lot of fish scraps and shellfish and fo some food scraps as well. And then we do screen it to um, a half inch screen, half inch or less. And at the end, we have this black, beautiful, life-filled goodness to spread onto your gardens and fields. <laughs> 100 times magnification. This is compost from Earth Care Farms. You can see it's, it's very full, but what I am seeing is not the fungal. Loads of bacteria, very diverse. Aggregates throughout, so nice, mature. No predators that I could find. Lots of organic matter. Not active and alive. The scale I'm able to achieve here by having this equipment, I'm able to process hundreds of tons of material a day, turn that into a rich living soil. My impact is so much more. 
So don't be intimidated by the equipment. That's something you can figure out. It's not hard. Um, and it's really empowering. This is in New Haven. I want to put that. I work with what's called RAT static file system. These are in vessel. We supply air through a system of PVC pipes in the back of the system. In a matter of 30 days, we take this material out and we put new material in. So this is the end product uh, that we, we really like and the, something that we're learning, not only the properties of this compost, but the soil biology that we might be producing. Are we producing the soil biology that we need to be able to guarantee all the beneficial properties of compost. Most importantly, the holding capacity of nutrients and the cycling property of the soil biology in the soil food web of your compost. We're doing thermophilic composting. Um, we measure out the ingredients with five gallon buckets and we'll do a 30 or a 40, gallon, 40 bucket pile. Um, pretty much every week we've been doing it. So we've got several piles here that are in different stages. Um, one we just made uh, yesterday, this one here. So you can see it's nice and green and fresh. We've got a pile like this, which is something that we would use in the field. And rather than that deep compost application, this is more of an inoculant. So if you smell this, it smells really sweet. There's a lot of uh, biological activity our microscope, which we do, you can see the bacteria, the protozoa, the fungi, um, the nematodes, all the good guys. 100 times magnification. This is from Asawaka Farm, a compost pile that's just finished. You see it is really teeming with fungi, various types of fungi, which is really good to see. And we're looking at 400 times magnification. You can see how diverse all of this one guy attached to this aggregate. So this would make excellent amendment to any soil, especially if you are planting more perennials that need a higher fungal ratio to bacteria. This would do really well. Okay, so um, that is our little look at different ways to do thermophilic composting. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention uh, about the, the thermophilic is that there are different sizes you can go and depending on, on what we want to accomplish. So, okay, the, the, the earth care farms might not have had the fungal that we want in there, but the fact that they can take in all of what would have gone into, I hate to say it, the incinerator, around where we are or a, a landfill, they are using those things like the fish and the, the food scraps and things um, on a very large scale. So yes, her impact is huge. And uh, we really have them to thank. And, and if we can do more of that larger scale, we can really reduce our waste and, and um, make, a, make an amendment that's really gonna help. Um, interestingly, the, um, the, 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 the compost that, that Domingo makes, he doesn't disturb that pile. He doesn't have to turn it. And this is something I'm really fascinated in. We're going to do an example of this at Simon's Rock. We're going to um, create a, 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 a windrow of compost with a uh, perforated pipe underneath, blowing air, which is con um, powered by solar. And this is how we're going to do our version of thermophilic composting um, in, a, in an ecology environment where, or you can do this on a community garden level or a farm level uh, where you don't necessarily have that heavy equipment to turn um, and you don't necessarily have those vessels, you can do this in a windrow situation. So that's something uh, we're going to be exploring this next year. All right, so static compost is, I hope everyone is doing this because it really does not require uh, much of anything. Um, and I know we all have food waste. So here's something if you have a little, we used to do it on the driveway, but so that no pest could get underneath. But having a, a vessel, this is open, but I would suggest um, a more closed vessel. And I have images of that. And it's basically, I like to call it lasagna composting, 
where what you're going to do is, um, I like adding the large branches on the bottom so you have some air circulation, but then layering it, like take my food waste and put it out there. And then I might add some leaves that I have kicking around. And then I might put some, some more greens. Um, I might have some soil, indigenous soil, and add that to in introduce the indigenous microbes. And then of course, watering in, always remember to water it. Um, although if I'm adding a lot of food scraps, it tends to stay moist. Uh, and then I just keep layering it on top of each other. And eventually um, it will um, slowly decompose. And I have this vessel where everything goes on the top and then I'll open these magic drawers underneath and pull out the black gold. And that is how I do it. Uh, it takes a while um, because it, you know, you're, 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 letting the, the microbes slowly do the work. You'll find though that, that uh, worms will tend to migrate into a compost um, static pile. So um, they will help with the, the decomposition as well. And maintaining a, temp um, a moisture of 30 to 35% is, is also key in this. Okay, so um, I'm going to touch on worm composting where you're using worms to take your food scraps and other organic materials and then make this, this um, what I call an amazing uh, soil amendment or worm castings, worm compost, uh, where they, the worms, um, they don't actually eat the food scraps. They eat the bacteria that is decomposing the food scraps. And um, so the result though of going through the gut of the worm and all the microbes is that those nutrients that are in the compost are now plant available, which we talked about that symbiotic relationship again between the plant and the microbes and how composting, especially in the case of worm composting where you tend to have the most microbial life will stimulate that symbiotic relationship. When I'm using worm composting, I won't just spread it onto a bed. I will mix it with seed starting mix. So when the seed germinates, those microbes are, are available and they can start that symbiotic relationship right away. The next key time to use worm composting is when I'm transplanting. So I'll take my transplant, I'll take a little handful of, of worm castings and plant it with the, the, the transplant. And that ensures that uh, that symbiotic relationship takes place. As those roots move and grow, the microbes multiply and move with those roots. And that is going to be helping, helping feed that, uh, that plant as it matures. The only other thing I'll do um, through the growing season is I'll do compost tea applications. And hopefully I will have time to talk about that. So I'm moving on. I'm assuming there's no questions. I don't see the chat lined up, uh, but if you do want to interrupt me at any point, please do. These are different ways to do worm composting. I'm always amazed by that image uh, of the large scale that they're doing at a prison in New Zealand. That, that's really impressive. Uh, but there are different types of worm bins you can have, um, including one that I have <laughs> and have had uh, nearby for the past 25 years, I must admit. Um, but there are, that's a stackable bin, but there are flow through worm bins and you can get on a larger scale. We went with a food delegation a couple of years back to Cuba, I guess five years now. And we visited 12 different farms. Every single farm, their main source of nutrients was worm compost. They didn't have access to chemical fertilizers and pesticides and things. And um, sure enough, they were growing amazing food uh, and that was their, their, their way of doing it. So I was really motivated by that. Um, when you are doing worm composting, um, just remembering what you're putting in there, you wanna have vegetables that are decaying. So you don't necessarily wanna take an apple core and put it in there because guess what? Three days, 10 days later, it's still an apple core and now fruit flies have joined the party. So you want to have food that there are different things you can do. You can put the, the, that type of food, um, veggie scraps and things in a Ziploc bag and put it in your freezer and that will break down the cell walls or you can um, put it in your compost and take out half decomposed compost and put that in your in your um, in your worm bin, 
so there have, I've tried different techniques. Um, I, we now, as a business, we go to the organic juicer bar and, and they save the, the juicer waste for us. So uh, uh, adding browns is also important. I've moved away from cardboard and paper and things like that. And we'll, for, for drying it out, we'll use more indigenous materials like maybe some soil, anything that will, will add more life and contribute. So indigenous soil will introduce those indigenous microbes to the worm bin. And again, as I mentioned, I'll add the trace minerals um, so that what we're finding is that those will be plant available in the finished compost. So any questions about that? Um, Liz just commented that for their worm castings, they use, uh, they just bought a storage box and drilled holes in it. Right. It's very simple. And I, I actually do an hour and a half talk on worm composting. <laughs> so we would get into things like that, how to build a worm bin and things. Um, but you can, you can Google that and you might see a video. Okay, so moving on. I would love to talk about worm compost tea. And um, I think we have time, so let's get dive right in. Um, basically, compost tea is the result of aerobically, adding air, aerobically brewing compost in water. I, uh, brewing is sort of the wrong word. Aerating, if you will. Um, compost in water, adding amendments, having those microbes feed off those amendments and multiply by the billions. So um, that's what we're going to apply. And you can do it as a foliar spray, as a root drench, different ways to apply the compost tea. But here's an example of, of the effect that it has. And I can remember being at the farm, the reservoir community farm and, and spraying this compost tea. And by the time I got to the end of the row of the peppers, literally the ones at the beginning were standing up, were <laughs> literally much greener and, and because they can immediately take in those nutrients um, through the leaves. So that was that convinced me and, pl and plus the test trials, which I'm going to share with you. So compost extract, and here's Dr. Ingham demonstrating that, is a little bit different and also very effective. You would take, say, any compost or in, in my case, worm castings, suspend it in water. Uh, I would massage the bag. Uh, in this case, she's using a 400 micron mesh bag. I used to use cheese cloth, which is a good way of releasing um, the, 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 the microbes, but holding in the, the organic matter. And then using that as a foliar spray or as a, as a root drench without adding any air or amendments and you use it right away. So um, that's an extract and it can be very effective. So I'm gonna talk about the tea. So here's a very simple example of what is going on with the tea. This is how we started with a five gallon bucket. We got an aquarium pump. Uh, the first one I submerged in the water thinking it was a, for like a, a pond pump, but no, <laughs> that didn't work. Went back to the store, got one and put the, the, um, the aeration stones in there and um, you pump it and so that there's oxygen. So the beneficial microbes will, will multiply. And then you have this, these wonderful amendments in there that they feed off. So I'm going to show you, I think the next one is a little video explaining the process in and two different um, locations where we're using compost tea. All right, so we're going to make some compost tea. This brew is going to be for gilberries. So let's mix our solution. The first thing it calls for is a cup of liquid kelp. And a good way to remember the ratio between kelp and fish is one to four. So if that was a cup of kelp, this will be a quarter cup. So when I use the humic acid, it's really at a little bit of an extra shot. The worm castings themselves have a lot of humic acid in them. And you can tell by how dark it is, cocoa color. Right, so Oops, we're sorry, I meant to just pause it there. Oh, um, I'll go back. But um, what I wanted to mention the recipe for a five gallon bucket is about two tablespoons of the kelp, 
half a tablespoon of the fish hydrolysate. And the reason I use fish hydrolysate is that um, unlike a fish emulsion, it is done with a cold process so that there are more nutrients in there. And also they don't remove the oil and sell that separately, it's in there. So it tends to be a much better product than an emulsion. All right, so let me just um, go to where we went. So we're going. Uh, we were right about here. Water that are bubbling away at Gilberti's. Hi, good morning. My name is Joe Gloria. I'm here at Gilberti's Herb Gardens, and we are brewing compost tea as we do every Saturday. First thing we're doing is we're putting in our hydrolysate. And that's where the magic begins. We put this in. He meant to say. Let it go a little bit. Amendment. And then we add, of course, the worm castings to this brew. And tomorrow, voila, compost worm tea, which is the best thing for all your plants. Now we're going to travel 100 miles north to Egremont, Massachusetts, and the Berkshires. This is April Hill run by Greenagers, a nonprofit working with young people doing green jobs. That's Justin Torico in the field in March. And here we are a few months later. Look at the development and the gardens that have been created, planted, and are now maintained by young people. And what are they using for fertilizer? Compost tea. Here's Mac to tell us more. So right here, we have a small scale compost tea brewer. And we're using this right now to kind of introduce the farm to the idea of brewing compost teas. So the reason for brewing a compost tea is that it inoculates your soil and your plants with beneficial bacteria and microbes. You can take this from this scale all the way up to large agriculture with huge 100 to 800 gallon brewers, and the concept stays the same. Edward is now watering in the seedlings that were transplanted last week. These are some beautiful tomatoes. And in fact, these particular tomatoes, if we look a week earlier, Ada is taking the transplants and submerging them in compost tea from that week's brew and potting them up. And again, applying those nutrients right around the roots of the transplanted seedlings. Justin Torico, he is watering in the seedlings that are getting ready to go into the field. And again, adding those nutrients and beneficial microbes right to these small seedlings so that that symbiotic relationship between the plant roots and the microbes can start early on. This is a great way to inoculate the soil and really give those seedlings an excellent start. All right, the compost tea is, uh, it, it's nice to use it because, you know, anything that seems like, wow, it's, you know, stagnated and grow, it's looking like it's starting, starting to turn in the wrong direction, get some compost tea, come back two days later, it's looking great. You know, I, guess, I love things like that. You know, there is no, like, uh, magic potion, but certainly there are ones that help. All right, so that is the video there. Are there any questions about that? Um, there is one question saying, do you need to use worm castings to make compost tea or can you use other organic materials like food scraps, grass clippings? Um, I would use a compost. Uh, I wouldn't, I mean, there are different um, foliar sprays that I, I know um, are, are very popular, um, which is different from compost tea. So uh, when I am doing the compost tea, I find the most microbes, which is what we're wanting to multiply, uh, exists in worm castings, but they also exist in soil and in other types of compost. Um, you saw from those videos how much light there was in, in some of those composts. And then we actually did this experiment where um, Ken Twombly was, was hiking in the state uh, park and he found, um, mountain laurels that were really healthy. And so he collected some of that soil and we looked at it under the microscope. And remember in that earlier video, that image of all that high fungal um, soil, that was from the, um, the, the mountain laurels. So we used that with some worm castings uh, to make a tea. 
And then I, I looked at it under the microscope and it was amazing how much fungal there was in that compost tea. So I sprayed it on my plants um, here, uh, my cher mountain laurels that have always been uh, looking <laughs> poorly and they did amazingly. And I hate to say it, well, I, I want to say it to tell you the truth, they're still looking great. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, there's things we don't quite understand. One of the experiments when we're doing at Greenagers is putting a lot of um, saplings, um, um, small fruit trees and nut trees. And what we've done is to do a similar process. We're taking soil from around indigenous mature cherry trees, for example, and nut trees that are growing on the property and adding that to our compost tea brew and applying that as a foliar spray around the roots of these saplings. And the idea is, and we need to do a lot more research on this, but the concept is that we are inoculating with the beneficial microbes that these particular plants will most benefit from. So. Okay. And then um, Lou asked, which I assume he is talking about compost in general. Um, we have, or he said, we have not, we have heard not to use newspaper due to toxic inks and material and materials in the photos. Um, is this true? Uh, well, uh, yeah, it's hard to look at ink and not go, ooh, why would I want to put that in there? But apparently um, all inks now for newspaper use a soy-based um, ink. But I still don't see a reason to add the, the newspaper. There are so many wonderful sources, um, organic sources of higher carbon. If you want to add those, I would recommend that. So I've moved away from shredded newspaper and, and cardboard in our new in the new worm bin or adding it to the compost. And I, I just won't do that. I will definitely add the cardboard um, as a layer in, in that process that I told you about in terms of building new garden beds. Um, but I think it's a wise or there are, uh, are much better options now for, for our compost bins than okay. adding paper. And then um, on our farm, we often use a compost mix for our, or compost tea for our flowers. Do you use different recipes for different plants? Um, I kind of answered that in terms of um, adding indigenous plants. Um, or sorry, indigenous uh, microbes from soils or car car compost that I know um, has the properties that I want. Another reason to learn microscopy, it's not hard. Uh, you're just looking at what's there, basically. Um, especially with compost tea, you'd add one drop and you could see what's there. Um, so I guess, uh, how do I answer that? Um, there is a book, and now I have to remember, I just was listening to a talk where they would take a specific, make create a, a foliar spray um, for say apples using apple leaves and thinking that that will inoculate um, whatever that apple needs to be stronger and, and, and have more nutrients. So there, and I'll try to remember the name of that book um, before the end of this session. Uh, but that's something that would be good to read. Great. And then um, Bill just said, Asian jumping worm worms invade my compost. So how do I prevent that in your, how do you prevent that in your mixes? Right. You do need to remove them. Uh, I had a very serious jumping worm problem and I found that they were wherever I had put um, scraps. So for example, um, flowers that I, were, I was finished with, weeds, I would make a pile, not put it in my compost. And then they, those jumping worms like to hang out right on the surface. And that's what they were. So I felt like I was making trap beds for them because that's where they would want to go. In your case, they're getting into your compost. So I would recommend spreading that compost out, pulling out every single jumping worm you can find, letting it dry out, and using that as your catch crop, if you will, I don't know how, to, how else to describe it. And then uh, this past last summer, not a single jumping worm, knock wood, did I find. I was very diligent the year before um, and had that sort of station where it seemed to attract jumping worms from everywhere um, because it was loose um, material. 
they will only hang out at the very top surface. I'm also thinking that drought last year helped. But if you have a compost pile, uh, there's no drought in there. So they're just going to keep parting. So you definitely want to annihilate the jumping worms from your compost or whatever you're doing and make sure you do not share that compost with anyone. Yeah, jumping worms. Oof. Okay, so um, are we good with questions right now? Uh, yep, we're all caught up. All right, so um, we're going back to some regenerative ag methods. Uh, we talked about cover cropping. Now we're going to talk about companion planting, crop rotation. I have 14 minutes left. Succession planting, intercropping, it's all quick. So we'll, we'll skip through these. Um, we talked about cover crops and basically it's just a plant whose purpose is to improve the soil. So um, in, well, I'll show you an example of something that's yummy and also does that. Um, you, you try of course to never have um, a bare, bare soil. So if you are going to uh, harvest, adding a cover crop right away is the best way um, or a succession plant, plant something else in that spot so it's never bare. Um, so uh, the, 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 you, the idea is that having something growing there, of course, will prevent erosion, build up fertility, and will add um, roots for the microbes to, to, to have that symbiotic relationship with, and it protects the soil, so many reasons. Um, it builds soil health, it, it will hold the nutrients, um, and will also stop weeds from coming there. Uh, here's an example of eating your cover crop. So I will, I really like using peas and oats um, as a cover crop. And what I also love is pea sprouts. And so when they get about, I don't know, six to eight inches high, I will harvest the pea sprouts, eat those. And then of course, all those wonderful uh, nitrogen fixing nodules in the roots will decompose and add nitrogen to your soil. So that's a, a fun way to, to have your cover crop and eat it too, if you will. <laughs> okay, so that's a good one. But the more diverse, oops, I thought I had another slide there. The more diverse the cover crops, the better. Um, and so that's why uh, adding, and I like to also, rather than have them, for example, I used to do a lot of winter rye and then in the spring that would take off. And if I didn't catch it in time, it would be a big job to turn it over. And guess what I'm doing? I'm disturbing the soil, which is not what you wanna do. So I've moved towards uh, winter kill cover crops, planting those in, in September, October when I'm harvesting my summer crop. And then those will winter kill. The, the top will act as mulch and the decomposing roots underneath will, be, will protect the soil, feed the microbes and, and um, add nutrients. So a lot of reasons to do cover crops. Companion planting as well. I love this chart. It's a really great way to, to show you um, good companions. And there are some bad companions, who knew? Uh, some interesting factoid, which I just learned about, um, the tomatoes are in the same, the Solanacea family with potatoes, but they don't get along. And yet I've heard of people using potato roots and cutting and grafting tomatoes onto them. So this is a whole thing when you start talking, um, I'm getting off on my tangent here, but basically companion planting is when you have plants that complement each other. But there are examples where it doesn't necessarily work that way. There are things that don't get along, as I mentioned, tomatoes and potatoes. Um, but there are also plants that complement everyone. So things like borage, uh, nasturtium, um, marigolds, they are companion plants to pretty much everything I can think of. And they all have uh, beneficial qualities. Cassidy asked, how do you feel about using tarps to solarize slash smother and kill cover crops? Excellent. I, uh, you would wanna cut it really tight to the ground um, and remove that layer, do the solarization, which if it's in the summer, can, you might only need on for 24 hours. Um, the longer you have it, the more uh, possibility of killing the beneficial microbes. But if you leave it on for 24 hours, um, it, it will kill the, 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 I use it for, for weed seeds more than anything else. Um, but in this case, you could kill off the, the cover crop and then take that, that 
um, plant what you want and then take that mulch that you, you've moved aside and put that over um, the, the debris, if you will, as mulch for over the plants. Hope that answered that question. Um, this is a, a very uh, traditional, if you will, uh, beautiful example of companion planting. Uh, which the Native Americans came up with, the Three Sisters Garden, uh, where you have corn, you have pole beans growing up, so they have the support of the corn, you have squash covering the ground and protecting the soil, and they all beautifully complement each other. The other thing we talked about was crop rotation, and I was explaining one method of crop rotation if you have a certain specific disease, but another thing to think of is also what is your crop adding or removing from your soil. So for example, brassicas are very high nitrogen fixing. In this case, I might follow it up, um, and it, oh, it does here, with a legume to add nitrogen and, and refix nitrogen into that soil. So changing what you grow in an area, in a certain bed, will help with um, also the diversity of the microbes that are in there, but um, adding different nutrients and avoiding problem recurring disease or pests in one area or one, one garden. Uh, the succession planting also, there's different ways to do it. Um, you could do it, plant everything at once and, and plant it so that everything matures at a different time during the growing season. Um, you can start plants um, that tolerate frost early, a couple weeks earlier, and then add a mid-season crop and then a third crop so that you're, you're, you're constantly adding a succession. Um, and then also if you're harvesting one crop, you'll add another in that same spot. Um, and then intercropping, where you have two or more that are non-competing, preferably companion plants together um, that, that might need different uh, maturity. Uh, rates. Um, uh, Justin Torco did a, a wonderful example of, of this in, uh, in the fields at Greenagers, where he took, we, it was a new garden, so he took potatoes, put it on the new compost that we laid down, covered that with compost, and then covered that with straw. Then he took shovelfuls of, of soil and put that on top of the straw in various places and planted lettuce which I thought was brilliant. So we would harvest the lettuce and then he would spread that out. And that as the potatoes are maturing, you have another layer to cover the potatoes. I thought that was an amazing use of a small piece of land and incorporating a lot of the concepts that we're talking about here. Um, and then again, you can plant the same crop over time. So if you plant all the beans the same day, of course, you're gonna have beans all harvesting on the same day. If you plant succession planting, where every two weeks you plant a new uh, row of, of beans, you will be able to harvest that as time goes on. Okay, let's see here. All right, so we're going to, how much time? We've got six minutes left. I'm gonna talk about some of the trials that I've done here. Um, these are going back where I, oops, had a mind of its own there, uh, where I would take regular seed starting mix um, and then just add 10% worm castings that I talked about and saw what happened. And you can see in the microgreen situation. Um, this was interesting to me. Oops, this is funny. It's got its own time, time zone. <laughs> it, I guess I had used these for, for something else. Um, anyway, so that you can quickly see the difference and I can talk about that later. Um, this, uh, a client sent this in talking about when they did the test trial, seed starting mix only, and then um, adding the worm castings, and then um, looking at the results after 60 days of um, what the, 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 the harvest looked like. This is a, a test that I did where I simply took um, soil that had chemical fertilizer. I bit the bullet and bought one of those bags, uh, so, slow release. And then I used organic soil with worm casting. So this is, you can see already the difference in terms of germination rate and, and the size of, of the plants. They were kept right side by side, same amount of light, watering, everything else, material, um, environmental conditions were the same. Um, this is June 2nd, so what was that? Um, 20 days later, 15 days later. You can already see the color difference. When I harvested the little bit of lettuce that I had in there, the one on the left was sort of chewy and tasteless. The one on the right was crunchy and sweet, which tells me it had more nutrients and was, was um, healthier. 
Um, and then look at this 20 days later, um, the chemical fertilizer plants had pest diseases. It really didn't, a discoloration compared to the, the jungle that I had with the organic side. So I, um, oh, this is a quick look at the, the microscopy. So this is the bag soil. You see there are no micro, uh, no aggregates. There's bacteria, but they're not acting naturally. They're not forming these, these aggregates, which you see in, in the regular um, organic um, soil with worm castings. Um, you've got those aggregate structures. You've got the hierarchy of, of the different trophic levels of soil life. All right, so finishing up here, um, unless we have any questions. Um, I just have one comment from Eric that I think we should get to before we get too far. Uh, he said, we tried composting our crop residue, but the amount of material was unmanageable for our already overworked team. I wanna make on-farm compost, but I haven't been able to make the labor worth it compared to just buying it. Um, and he's wondering if you have any suggestions. Well, oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. That's why um, what we're hoping to do, I don't know if I'm, just, we're, we're trying to write grants to get these, um, I was talking about that static aerated pile system into farms as an experiment, because it's not an expensive endeavor where you would have that windrow and you could lay all, you would lay all of that material that you're talking about over that pipe that's going to be, um, you do have to regulate it, but once it reaches a certain temperature, you can aerate it to cool it down. And again, um, it would be powered, so it could be out in the field, it could be powered by solar. And so um, we're working with Domingo on this to find a way to introduce that into farms. So hopefully we'll be able to, to speak more about this um, next conference when, when we've tried it um, and um, hopefully get some of these grants that we're, we're applying for at NOFA um, to, to bring these to farms. So yeah, I, I hear you <laughs> and felt that pain. So um, uh, very quickly, I'm uh, just gonna do a quick um, talk. Of, this was 2019 where they gave me two 90 foot rows at the Hickory's farm to do a test trial. And so I planted the same thing three times. I did a soil test beforehand and I, for the control, you can see I have um, a lot more nutrients in that soil, which was good because now it's a real test for the side that I added worm compost. So what I did again, I added the 10% to the, the same amount of, same type of seed starting mix, added 10% of worm castings to the one on the right. Um, and then I added uh, half a cup or a cup of, of um, worm castings when I did the transplant. And uh, then I just applied compost tea every three weeks. Now, to make it fair for the control, I took those same amendments, but didn't brew it into a tea. I just added the amendments the same way as a foliar spray and a root drench um, to each bed. Then I started harvesting and I planted um, paste tomatoes um, so that I could make sauce. Um, and so um, I found the harvest was a lot different. Uh, when I got around to making the sauce, the the most interesting result, the control had all these pests and uh, the bruises and were de um, decaying much quicker, which I was not expecting rather than, and so I couldn't really use those tomatoes mostly. Um, here's some other uh, examples of what I was harvesting from the control side. Um, and again, here we have two days after harvest, the control tomatoes were not holding up. Here's some more harvesting over time, every date. Um, now we're expecting frost, so we had to harvest whatever we had left, including some green tomatoes. We let those sit uh, for 15 days, but the control didn't hold up. Where the ones on the, on the side where we had the worm castings and compost tea, we had a, a much longer shelf life and a, I guess a healthier uh, fruit. Um, so that was really surprising to me to see those types of results. And um, I'm done, <laughs> and it's 3.15, whew. So um, thank you for, for being here and I um, um, hope you enjoyed the talk. Yeah, Monique, thank you so much. That was really fascinating and it's great to hear all the different sides of our soil. Um, and even looking at your last example, it's incredible to see that difference 
um, between just like that one season of the the control versus with the foliar spray. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you so much. And any test trials that you want to try, please send them our way because we're fascinated uh, by learning and, and um, figuring out the best methods of working with nature. So thank you for being here. Great. And thank you so much. Everyone in the chat is saying thank you. They're very inspired and um, they're willing to try it. Go to <laughs> <laughs> All right. Perfect. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for coming by. Thanks.